What's up, good movie lovers? Welcome to a movie review for Inception. And back is Jonas. It's been a while, buddy. Yes, I'm really glad to be back. I'd love to get into it. This is a great movie. I'd love to talk about it. Yeah. I've been waiting for this all summer long. So we, We've saved it for the best. We're talking that there weren't a lot of good movies to see this summer. I mean, I kind of wanted to see A-Team, but not enough to really motivate me to go out yeah. and get to the theater to see it. Yeah. Other than that, I also kind of want to see Sorcerer's Apprentice. For Nick, Cage for, Nick Cage, for Nick Cage, just to see he looks you're, absolutely you're Nick Cage holic. He looks absolutely ridiculous in that movie, <laughs> just in the trailer alone. But yeah. But here we have a uh, Christopher Nolan with his uh, "I can do whatever I want" Inception. Yep. And I gotta tell you, I was a little disappointed. Okay. I don't think I liked it as much as you did. I saw your review online. I saw you. Your balls were blown off. <laughs> they, they, were, they were. They were. They were sore for a couple days afterwards. Yeah. And maybe it was a case of too high expectations. Uh-huh. Just no one's one of my favorite directors working today. I love him. I love what he does. Uh, he does everything he does with quality. I love all you know, Dark Knight, Batman Begins, Memento is one of my favorite movies of all time. Mine too. Prestige is great. Uh, I had high expectations, and also because the trailer was just unbelievable. Totally. It was one of those that just grabs. You're just like, I Makes can't you wait think to see about this. it. Yeah, yeah. You're like, yeah, starting. It's like Lost, where you're starting to kind of put your own. And your imagination's running wild. Right. Like, this has to be awesome. Kind and of that's my main complaint, is actually a kind of lack of imagination. I was really disappointed. I was talking to my friends who we went to see this, that there wasn't more reality-bending, matrixy stuff. Okay. You know, not to be a Matrix ripoff, but just yeah. the idea that in dreams, anything can happen. And we have the scene where the uh, the girl, I can't remember the actress's name, but Michael Caine's... Uh, Juno, yeah, right? Yeah, the Juno girl, yeah. where she's the architect, and she starts to bend her dream world to her will. That got cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, the scene, you know, where he falls in the water tank, and the water all rushes in. Yeah. But in the main dream sequence, the main course of the movie, the big, the big heist, you know, thing, basically what we got was a lot of gunfights. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if this is kind of his way of getting out of not having to do with this dream bending stuff where he says like if it becomes too unreal yeah, everyone then starts to notice and the dream falls apart that's tr- yeah I guess but they could have done more with the building of the worlds yeah because there wasn't enough there's a big deal about her making mazes and we see a really cool model of like a 3D maze it looks really interesting right and but the levels weren't very maze like it seems like also if they made the levels that they the the thieves should have had a distinct advantage over the defense mechanisms. Sure. Because sure. they would have known all the little hiding spots and where to go and the tricks. And the only time we really see that is where Gordon Levitt's on the stairs in the hotel and it's an M.C. Escher stair. More of that, I think, would have been cool. They didn't do enough of that. Each of the levels was kind of just... It, it was just a level. It was just, we, you know, we had the cityscape, we had the hotel, and then they were a Hoth for some reason. <laughs> <They're not. laughs> yeah, I've read something where, I guess, like, he was influenced by James Bond, maybe, like, the On Her Majesty's Secret Service, oh, okay. like, with the kind of snow, that was the famous, like, okay. snow stunning stuff. Because I was going to see a walker, I was going to see one of those giant walkers go by at any moment. <laughs> I was expecting to see more, like, stuff bending and morphing and all that kind of effects going on. I was reading that, I guess he came up with the idea about ten years ago. Roughly the time around Memento. Okay. And I think that was before like the CGI boom kind of took off. So maybe he kind of set himself like, I'm just going to, you know, in that mentality of like 1999, 2000, I'm just going to. Right, there wasn't what so I much have. you could do visually. Yeah. There was a limit on that. It's, I can admire, but it's, you know, on the other hand, it's like, well, you have CGI, so why don't you kind of. Why don't you use it? Of it's it. a tool you can use. You, yeah. It's like, and nowadays, especially when it's so seamless and it's so, you can. Big part of why I go to event movies is to see something that's not possible to see in real right, life. Right, right. And even though I'm not likely to see a gun battle in real life, it's still possible. Uh-huh. But the actual, like, the, the road bending upside down and becoming a ceiling and merging with, you know, that like I can't... Like the city, city yeah, building Yeah, that itself. I can't see, and that's what I want to see. That's yeah. why That's why I went to IMAX, because uh-huh. I was expecting a lot of that. And I did not need the IMAX experience for right, this movie. Right, right, yeah. Just seeing it in IMAX, I guess the sound system kind of helped. The score was unbelievable. Yeah, score Hans was Zimmer, really is that, that's the name, right? Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer, yeah. Ba- Batman Begins. Yeah, Batman, yeah, Dark Knights. Yeah, just unbelievable. There was one part, though, it was a little over. They were, like, forcing it a little. There was mm-hmm. kind of the moment when, like, they're kind of getting the plan ready. And it was, if the music wasn't there, it, it almost felt like they could, they they felt that it was like, oh, this is kind of slow. So let's just get the music exciting <laughs> and kind of, like, force us. Right. But other than that, it was just a really kind of, like, a cool. Just like dark, kind of o- dark, ominous a little bit, sinister. yeah, and like the dome, dome, yeah. that kind of stuff. And there were like moments when on IMAX you could appreciate it, but it wasn't like a super IMAX experience. I can totally see your point in, in that. I think Nolan 
maybe he didn't use everything that's available to him at the moment. Yeah, exactly. I feel like he scaled back a little bit when he didn't need to. He had carte blanche to do whatever he wanted with this yeah, movie, basically. Yeah. And I just don't feel it went to its full potential. Yeah. Now, idea-wise, what that, do you think of the idea-wise? I, I lo- idea-wise, I thought it was a, a phenomenal film. I thought it was just... A, a big part of what I liked about it was the economy of the storytelling, uh-huh. which was just, let's just throw you into this world. We don't need a backstory. We don't need any exposition about the why, how the dream thievery works or like, you know, how it came into existence. It just is. Yeah. yeah. And we accept that and we go with it. Totally. And, you know, each of the characters doesn't really have any backstory. They're just good at their jobs, you know, just criminals. And mm. that's that. Uh, and I was really impressed by there's no love story. The yeah. only love story is between DiCaprio and his dead wife. You know, I think another director's hands, or if it was left to the studio, they would have made him and the architect a couple. Well, yeah. They would have created romantic tension between them. Sure. And there didn't need to be, and there wasn't, and it was, I'm glad they didn't. Because that's kind of like a trap that a lot of movies will fall into. It's like, we just got to throw a romance in. We, yeah, we need to have a romance. Yeah. You don't need to have a romance. You don't. Like, kind of, it ruined Gangs of New York for me. To okay. Be, <laughs> but that's another story. Well, and this kind of had, like, that Ocean's Eleven kind of vibe. Yeah. So it's like minus the Julia Roberts, George Clooney kind of thing going on. Right. This is a caper movie. Caper movie, yeah. But with a lot more on its mind. Yeah. An existential caper movie. Uh, absolutely. So just that whole notions of the levels of the dreams and the subconscious yeah. and all that. And I liked the, how they explained it. It was kind of, you know, there were moments when it's like the Matrix where, you know, Morpheus sits him down. He's like... Here's how it all works. Yeah, we're all a battery. That pens, was you know? that was basically the scene with DiCaprio and the architect, yeah. which just lays it all out. But that, you know, but it took like five minutes of screen time, yeah. and then we understand everything. And it's, it moves. You know, you know, here are the rules. Here's uh-huh. the rules of the game. This is what we're gonna be playing. Yeah. So you know, we're the audience is Juno, and we're being taken into it for the first time. Exactly. Here's what you need to know, and here's how everything works, and boom, boom. Yeah. I guess I'm kind of approaching the movie from like, because I've been it's been two weeks, and I'm thinking like, how do I even start trying to even trying to review this thing? Right. This is one of those movies where it's like. You go in kind of looking for something wrong, where it's like, okay, I hear it's going to be great. It's made by a great filmmaker, so I'm going to be extra critical and like, what can I really kind of, you know, pull out that I can see that he did wrong or something? Characters, like you said, do they need to be so developed? Is it fine we just kind of meet them and they're kind of their, you know, they are they're good at what they do, but do we need to have more and you know, in terms of them? Like I was thinking of uh, Armageddon recently for some reason. Okay. I, know, I know it's some Michael Bay. Well, right. he's in Chicago right yeah, now, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, with the uh, Transformers, and um. They do this pretty cool thing in there, like, before they go off to the asteroid, they're like, here's one last thing I want on before right. I go off. And it gives a good uh, idea, a quick synopsis of what the character is, yeah. the, what they're about. And, yeah, I just, you didn't need it. The only character you need backstory for is Leonardo DiCaprio. Right. And they do that in space. They do a great job fleshing him out. I really bought him as a three-dimensional character. Like, I understood him. Right. Uh, one of the sidebar, one of the things I loved about the movie also, there's no traditional villain. There's no Agent Smith. The villain yeah, that's is, another his, aspect. is his subconscious. Which is a cool thing, yeah. yeah. Very smart kind of idea behind it. Right. His wife and himself kind right. of. Right, and his wife wasn't wasn't like an Agent Smith type villain. She wasn't the bad guy. Right. You know, it was just and I like that because oh, it mirrors real life almost. It's like, you know, how often in life do we come across some evil mastermind that's right, trying to foil right. our plans? Yeah. You know, usually we sabotage ourselves. That's true. And, and that's when I know, like, well, um, when I was learning teaching screenwriting, it was very much, we always warned about the scripts where it's, you're your own opponent. Your habits are against, you no, know, you need, like, someone who's going to personify that. Huh. And Nolan's coming off of maybe creating one of the best villains ever, oh, the every, Joker, right. and he kind of now does the opposite, where there's really no kind of huge figure. Yeah. That's an awesome point. That's that's absolutely, maybe like that businessman guy, the um, Sato right yeah he could have become kind of like that where he's like i want to control things and you're listening to me kind of stuff yeah but he did i like the way they fit him in he was just there in the action there to get shot get shot and to fall into the horrible which was a great they did a great job of raising the stakes by the way yeah where i wasn't sure if i was going into the big heist i'm like well if you get shot you get we wake up what's the big deal when they explain that the The more than dream time the limbo (laughs) thing and you go insane basically yeah and that whole like the the, how the time started changing in each level that i love that that was brilliant the way right. like, each level is a different le- strata of time yeah that's and, fantastic i mean essentially what he does for the last hour here is he makes three movies at once right you know and there's like three objectives and that i mean like just filmmaking wise that's something that i don't i mean i can't really remember seeing normally we're just kind of doing the one objective but here we have like three going on simultaneously and i mean just the way that he just uh orchestrates that is just you know really 
Masterful. That, yeah. that was very impressed by that. Yeah. So how did it resolve for you and everything? And let's just talk about I, that. I loved the ending. I thought it was great. I'm a big fan of open endings. Yeah. I love the ending of Sopranos. I love the ending of No Country for Old Men. Mm -hmm. I like when things are, end ambiguously. Yeah. And one of the main points of the movie, I, you know, there is no right answer. Yeah. There is no was he dreaming. We, we cannot know. You know, because the top starts to wobble, but it could have just started spinning it again. Could have we just, just kept spinning. Yeah. There's no way to know. And what I like about that, one of the points, I'm not sure if he was trying to make, but what I got from it is, even if it is a dream, what's so bad about that? That's yeah. He gets that's to true. live. He gets to live out his fantasy. Mm -hmm. He gets to live happily ever after. Yeah. The only bad part may be if he, he wakes up sometime. You know, but if he's just if he's just lost in the subconscious for for you know years and years and years. I think that's great. That's, yeah, a, that's, that's a happy too. ending for him. Yeah, and in the meantime, we had this great journey. They pulled off the heist. It was a fun experience for right. us. So that doesn't get taken away. And we get this nice thing of, okay, now we get to ask questions for right. months after. You know, what is this real or is it not? Yeah. And there's kind of that image earlier when he's like, I planted the idea in my wife's mind. You know, and he spun the top there, too. Right. So, you know, this is Nolan, I guess, kind of like planting the doubt in our mind. Like, oh, now we got to think if it's real or not. Mm -hmm. When he's walking through the airport at the end... Mm -hmm. And he's just looking at everybody. That was the only moment for me, um, in terms of character development, like, if we would have known a little bit more about what each character would have wanted to get out of it for themselves, hmm. I think that moment when he's looking at everyone, we get a better resolution, because, like, we got a resolution for him. Right. But we didn't get a resolution for everyone else. But I know? got, you know, for the other ones, there wasn't an emotional stake. Yeah. There wasn't the, you know... Well, I mean, it kind of was a cliche. This is my last job. I needed to get yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. Of thing. But he, it works because, yeah, he really did yeah. have a stake in it. He wanted to get back to his kids, and it worked. Yeah, and it's a super simple objective. Like, I need to get back to this. Right, that I've and lost. this is the way I get this there. This is the way I get For the there. For you know, the other guys were just along for the ride, yeah. and it's only because he didn't tell them how possibly dangerous it was right. that it was a big deal. Yeah. Like, they yeah. were just in it for the money, you know, and that's fine. They were just, you know, they were just there, and that's cool. Yeah, so... See, I actually saw it twice. So okay. the first time I was just like overwhelmed, blown away, like, okay, I got to think about this now. Someone pointed out that the wedding ring, that in the dreams he has the wedding ring on, but when he's planning the heist, there's no ring on oh. his finger as kind of a clue of maybe the reality versus okay. dream world. But then, you know, maybe he's just fooling himself. Was so there a wedding ring on the end then is the question. That, I, don't like, remember, I don't remember I, could, I didn't see it because like the way they filmed it, it was too quick or maybe I didn't notice. I think there wasn't. That's a signal that it isn't, but then the kids don't age. So, again, that's another. That's kinda, yeah, I didn't even noticed that. Yeah, the kids weren't. Yeah, they were exactly the same as same in his dream. They that. were exactly the same. But yeah. then in the credits, they were listed as different ages. Where it's like hmm. playing them at three years old, playing them at two years old. Okay. So it's like right. maybe they they're poor. They only have this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because what walking out of this, I felt like Pepe Le Pew. You know, like <laughs> like I felt like it sweet talked me. It was like you're so beautiful. I'm gonna take care of you. I'm going to caress you, and we're going to make love, and I'm going to hold you afterwards. <laughs> and this isn't just going to be, you know, just like a typical movie that's just going to drop some GHB, take my money, and <laughs> you leave me disoriented. Right. I'm going to wake up and be like, well, uh, what did I watch? You, you know, know, it's because it, Nolan and his, and his brother, you know, are masterful storytellers. Yeah, yeah. They just excel at creating worlds that we want to get lost in and that mean something to us and characters right. that mean something to us and uh, a visual sense that just is... Completely enveloping. Absolutely. And the performance here is solid. DiCaprio, again, awesome. Yeah, all the actors were great. Yeah. All the actors were great. Yeah, they were um, fantastic. Gordon Levitt, was, uh, like, kind of stole the show a little bit. I yeah, liked he him was, a lot. He was this. great. I really want to see more of him and more yeah. stuff. And Tom so. Hardy. Yeah, yeah, he was Yeah, he was really cool. Yeah, I What else is he in? I, was meant so, to look, uh, I meant to look that up. Yeah, he's in some other movie where, like, he doesn't even look like he looked in okay. this. Someone mentioned it to me. I'm like, that was this guy? Yeah, he was great. Yeah. Oh, and random Tom Berenger sighting. <laughs> How cool is that? League, Major League, baby. Yeah, Platoon. back from the dead. <laughs> that was nice the to see. I haven't seen him since The Substitute 2. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't seen himself since then. <laughs> Maybe he's wondering, like, is this a dream? I'm in a good Hollywood movie now. <laughs> Tom Berenger, I love it. Yeah, yeah. good to bring him it's, back. Is Inception going to make a splash in the way that audiences want movies? You, you know, know this, does, is there hope because of this now? This is something you know, you're talking about on, on Facebook, on your website, yeah. and I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about this. The biggest problem is that people still will go see crap with big noise and big explosions. They'll see horrible movies 
like Transformers, Transformers 2, and probably Transformers 3. Yeah. People still pay money for those, and they're, those make a ton of money. So until those, until like you say on your movie Apocalypse page, until we <laughs> stop and we say no as an audience and stop paying for these movies, right. we're not going to see an increase in quality.